going to open up this beginner's workshop and see if my head's in the camera. Better, right? There we go. Just waiting for people to come in, for you reviewers. I guess we should do a starting soon screen like we do on Twitch, but I'm a YouTube novice. Do we have any? Okay, we should have, in a perfect world, yeah, all right, the mic's working. Let's see. Simo. Es ist gefährlich, ob ich äh, Deutsch auf Livestream reden. Aber ja. Ja, ich mache ein paar ähm, Sachen für Anfangers mit Ableton. Und ja. Das war's. Wie geht's? Yeah, I try. All right. Let's go. Yeah, I don't know uh, how how the uh, the YouTube live format works. On Twitch, we're usually doing a beginner's, uh, like a starting screen. Let people stroll in. But uh, yeah, YouTube's kind of a different format. So who we got in here? And what's the what's the experience level? Let's have a chat about what what you're learning, what you're struggling with. Questions you have, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start playing this. By the way, if you have not already gotten this session that I'm sharing with everybody, then go ahead and download it here. Let's get the smarts. Uh, 
copy Dropbox thing. There we go. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. It's all techno music. How you doing? All right, let's give this a listen. How do you make a fat bass line? Well, first thing I'll say is this. The big thing you have to choose is you have to choose between a lot of times between a kick and a, and a bass, and you need to choose which one of those you want to drive the other, right? A mistake that I made uh, when I was first getting my feet wet was I was making, because who wants, who wants a kick drum without a huge decay, right? Boring. So I was always letting out the decay on all my kicks. Uh, and then you, you get into the mix and you say, I don't get it. I'm using this kick super fat when I solo it. Then when it's in this track, it just does not work. Um, and that's because you really need to be cognizant of the, a baseline and a kick are competing for a lot of the same frequencies. Ideally, the baseline sits a little bit above the kick, but you're still you've still got quite an overlap, and um, so so a big part of that is is the tuning of the baseline. There's there's kind of a sweet spot. Uh, another thing is is making sure that the kick and the bass are not competing for the same space. Um, and something that I showed in in the last little session is that you can actually cheat a little bit with with bass lines. So, and what I mean by that is we've got this loop here. And the kick's hitting on the 1 and the 1.2 in relation to this bass line. But it sounds like this bass line just really sounds like it's hitting boom 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 like on the on the beat and on the downbeat. But this bass, you can move these notes right here, okay? You can move them off the kick. And it's still gonna sound, it's still gonna sound the same because you've got, you, you've, your mind is kind of distracted by that, that kick hitting there anyway. So your, your kick is kind of acting as the transient for that bass line. And... So if you pull it off, if you pull that bass note just a little bit off the grid, um, and I, I wouldn't, someone would have to get a calculator out to know the milliseconds of this, but, but you basically give a, enough breathing room for that initial snap of the kick to punch through, and you're not losing anything with the bass line, and you can actually just move it. Let's solo, let's solo this here. So let's just let's just do the bass solo. And so here you don't you start hearing it you start hearing it kind of flange there. And that's when you know okay you got to you got to reel it back in a little bit. Oh, I didn't even have the right screen on. What an amateur. Um, let me pull up. Let me switch these screens here. There we go. So um, you're going to, I'm moving this bass line right off, right off the grid. And you're not hearing it. You're just starting to hear it sound a little bit wonky right there. But up until that point, you're not hearing any any variance between there and there. So that's buying, it's basically buying time for the kick to get what it needs to say through. And then the bass line can kind of carry it out. How's that for <laughs> Bob Mo <laughs> Bob Mograbi? Is that a uh is that a wordplay?
So I'm just going to start working on this. And if questions come up, then, then I'll answer them and I'll kind of talk myself through um, the process. Let's get this unsoloed here. actually gonna start putting a little bit of movement on this in the return tracks you just right click insert return track and then yeah there's a keyboard shortcut that I never use for some reason and let's put these let's keep the reverb as return let's So now we've got two extra return tracks. And what I'm gonna do to create some movement, and let's keep let's do the auto filter. Let's do this. Let's give it a little LFO. And then we're gonna do a let's just do a simple delay. No problem, Bob. Bob, something to think about. I'm just gonna call you Bob. Something, uh, something also to think about is a lot of times whenever I was hearing tracks that I really loved, it just sounds like the, the, the bass was always a continuation of the kick. And a lot of times what you're hearing is you're just hearing the transient of the kick and then the bass is doing all the work, right? I think it was, I think it was actually, um, I think it was actually Dead Mouse who had talked about, um, he had talked about like how people are always obsessed with tuning drums and he basically is of the school of thought that most times you don't need to worry about that because your drum sound is not, it's, it's emitting, uh, the attack of, of the groove, it's not really carrying out any kind of uh, low end information. A lot of times, a lot of times you've got you've got the the bass line that's doing all the work. I don't know if I fully disagree or fully agree with with the fact that tuning of drums never matters. And I don't I didn't interpret that as as him saying that, but I think. Um, I think there is some truth in a lot of times people are hearing something and they think it's the kick they're hearing, but it's actually the kick working in conjunction with the bass line. And you just think that the kick has this real crazy big tail on it. And a lot of times it's a real snappy, really punchy kick. So yeah, that's just something to consider. Okay. So I've got some, I've got auto filter set up uh to do like an lfo sweep let's do let's keep it slow moving here and then we'll do eh, let's now if you yeah and if you do have a decay if you do have a really large decay on the kick then it will start. I mean, it's it's producing a bass note, right? And if that if that bass line is out of tune with the kick, then you're gonna have some problems. And another thing to think about when you're adjusting, when you're dealing with the tune of the bass or dealing with the tune of of a kick, if you're dealing with in this case, we're dealing with samples. So this this right here. It's a 909 sample. Once you start pitching it up or down, you start losing a lot, a lot of the fundamental power of the sound that you have. So in this case, you've got a sample as a kick, and then in the 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 bass line sound is actually a synthesizer. So 
tuning the synth is it, you're not going to lose any sonic um uh, let's say uh you're not going to lose any sonic value by pitching it up or pitching it down so if you if you've got a sample and a synth that you're trying to tune always tune the synth don't tune the sample if the sample if if you don't like the tune of a sample the the best advice i can give you is to find a sample that has a tune that you already like now there there is some things that you can do that would that can be an effect of sometimes a pitch down like i really like pitch down hi hat samples so in this case right here i like sometimes almost playing a chord with my hi-hats so if i just take this here and let's just copy and paste because i'm lazy um we've got the here on the downbeat and samplers are usually operating as c the c3 is the root note meaning that that's going to be the 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 note that you play at a normal pitch so let's go in user library um samples dun, 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 dun. nope that's not gonna work let me just go into drums pull my own drums real quick um we'll use something that Arjun gave us um if he's nope. Let's do Zahn. Zahn, I know he has some some samples in here. And he gave he gave us he was very nice to give us a sample library from uh when we started things up. So let me just find a sample pack here. Leaving's got the kicks. There we go. We got trunk eight. Let's do that. So if you've got a sound like this, sometimes what I like to do So now it's at normal pitch. What I'll do sometimes It's way too pitched down. And I'll, I'll flange it just a little bit so they're not hitting exactly together. Let me zoom in on this. Do if you do like a let's just do an open hat. That'll work. And bring down the velocity on you. You still want the the fundamental or the root note to punch through. So you've got that as the normal hat. And you can get stuff like this. I, I think the, the first time I ever heard it was the, the, some of the first records I ever learned how to DJ with were some of DJ Sneak's old records on Strictly Rhythm. And he always had this hi-hat sound. And I couldn't figure it out. And, and really what it was is it was a pitch down open hi-hat sound that, that he was using. I could never, I was originally just looking for, for all these sounds like that, that sounded like what DJ Sneak was using. And then, yeah. There you go. So 
the the only time that I would say just be aware when you're using samples and you're starting play starting to play with the pitch you lose a lot of that transient whenever you start adjusting the pitch on pre-existing samples. So yeah. Augustine, how you doing? And where were we? Where were we? We're creating some movement on this. just personal preference i really like taking on the you pull up the simple delay something i really like doing is um throwing it a little bit out of sync not too much but just have the delays i like the delays that don't sound quite right you know if they if they're perfectly on the grid it always sounds well perfectly on the grid and and that type of stuff is is sometimes when you have like a, you can't figure out why the the tracks that you're making sound flat or kind of lifeless. A lot of times it's because everything is perfectly on the grid, and that's not how music works. Um, and the if you can humanize everything that as much as you can. You know, this is machine music and, and humans are listening to the machines. And so you, you need to, machines offer a lot of advantages creatively, but you have to also remember that, that the groove that a machine has is, is perfect and, and humans don't have, I mean, if, watch me dance, if you think that humans have a, uh, a perfect sense of groove and it's you kind of have to play into that imperfection in my opinion and I, I think a lot of like I love old disco records and whatnot and those are super super loose and that's where you get that funk and that that soul from it if it was all like if you heard disco records that were perfectly quantized you would have never heard disco records because they would have never been released because it would have sat not sounded good um so yeah we're creating some movement with the delays by by doing this here keep that at a hundred so i've got this lfo you you hear how it's kind of going in i'll solo this And now, let's go ahead and copy this group, but let's do it in the opposite direction. Let's put that low pass on this. But what I do want to do is I want to make sure that the really low, because you've got a you've got a kick drum bus going here, and you don't want you don't want your delays getting too caught up in the kick frequency range. So let's do an audio effects. Let's take an EQ eight. And a lot of times, this can just be kind of instant inspiration, right? So let's also take this delay. And let's make this one different for some. And then we'll take uh, the phase. Let's take the phase and off or offset it a little bit so they're not going at the same time. Now let me solo these. Obviously, that's not going to work. (laughs) 
There we go. And these are just two two delays running through a filter um, that's got an LFO on it. So the filter moves back and forth. And I'll pull up the I'll pull up the sound tool uh, sound toys one. I won't keep it in the session so that you all will be able to have it uh, have this full session on your computers. But this is what this is what an LFO does in this scenario. So if you add it's called mod here. But then you go into here, you add LFO, and as you bring up the rate or lower it, here's what's happening. That's what you're seeing. If you lower the, fr the, the rate of when it cycles through, that's what it's looking like on the filter. Unfortunately, on Ableton's auto filter, it doesn't uh, show you the movement. Um, so you just kind of have to, I mean, you can hear it but doesn't show it to you. So, and then in in our instance, we're doing rhythmic so that it's on time with them. It's synchronized with the music. That's, um, if you go, that's the difference between the Hertz, which is cycles per second. And then you can do the sync, which is synced in time with the, with the, with the metronome or the, the tempo of the track. Okay. So now let's, let's give this a go. Whoa. a little forward. And remember we brought up this, we had this synth rise. we've got a little bit of a structure of a track I think now would be a good time to actually go into uh, a few more of the effects that that we use in Ableton okay so first thing we've got the bass drum so let's pull up something how you would uh how you would color a bass drum sound and something that a lot of th that's been happening a lot now that uh, let me say this aesthetics of music change over time so for example if you ever have uh go back to records from before you have to you have to listen to them you don't have to do anything, but I would encourage you to listen to them taking into account the context in which they were written. For example, um, let's take the, the minimal era of like, let's say from 2005, 2004 to 2008. And you go back and listen to that stuff and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily 
always age well sonically. But you have to understand that all that stuff was was written in the same context of the other tracks around it. So this is how you get things like loudness wars. Like if you listen to um, a famous example is Metallica's uh, St. Anger, where it was like so loud the the cd was so loud that it reached this breaking point in the loudness wars where fans the their most diehard fans were petitioning to get a refund on this because they had taken the 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 mix so loud because nobody wanted nobody wanted the quietest track on the radio and equally speaking in dj sets dj's are always playing not always, but a lot of times you can play tracks that sound completely different sonically. The key is, is you don't want to have the two very different sonic characteristics butting up against each other. Um, and so what's, where we're at right now is fast forward to a world that went from the minimal era was like very entry level software. I mean, software was just getting good enough to write everything stand in, in the box, like what we're doing now, but it wasn't quite there yet. So everybody was super excited about things like Ableton. People were using Fruity Loops and Reason and uh, they were cranking out good tracks that in that in the context of what they were making it for made sense um now we have uh people that after there was kind of this mass rebellion against software so to speak and it became kind of this badge of honor to not use software uh and to only use hardware all analog and a lot of people they use the term analog and it's not really analog gear, but that's neither here nor there. People wanted to see gear and Instagram became this uh, unstoppable force in the music industry. And so people started using hardware more. Um, now the aesthetic is very is very hardware sounding. It's a lot dirtier, um, whether you listen to house music or, or techno a lot of times the aesthetic is 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 not very clean and and that's where we're at so the, the reality of it is is you can do all the you can emulate hardware sounds with with software um, it, so it's very important to realize that that you don't need hardware to to make this aesthetic be similar Disco Tech, how you doing? Good to see you. So let's go. Let's go to one of the the go to plugins that is going to be super useful for dirtying up the sound, and that is the saturator. So let's just get a little bit on here. Whoa, whoa. So let's just solo this. Obviously, you hear you hear what uh, very drastic examples are doing. That's completely dry, completely wet. Um, once you get it to this point, you you've sucked out all the bass out of it, and you're you're not gonna. It's not going to sound on sound systems the way you want it to. I promise you. Um, yeah. So here's, um, here's something that else. The bass is going to further, further emphasize everything, right? Um, so if you, if you use this bass here and you're, you've got it turned up, it's basically exacerbating how much saturation is being used on the, the fundamental frequency. So there you're, you're kind of rolling off. And 
and that's more neutral. So there's a couple there's a couple ways you can do it. You can play around with the dry wet, which works. Um, but you can also, if you want to do different processing on it, what I sometimes will do is I'll group it. I don't know why I put such an emphasis on the word group. So I'll group that and then I'm going to create another right click. It automatically creates a chain where the kick drum is passing through the saturation. Let's put it all the way wet. And then let's do another one, create a chain. And that's a completely dry change. So if I solo that second chain that I created, there you have it. And that's the completely wet chain. And you would say, well, why, would you, why wouldn't you just adjust the dry wet? Because in a situation like this, for uh, kick drums, you start losing you start losing some of the critical mass of a kick drum as soon as you start putting uh, putting any kind of effect on it. I keep lower in this chair. Before you, as soon as you put any kind of effect on it, you start degrading the sound. Um, and sometimes you, you want to be able to do that. And sometimes though, you want something to be punching through. So keep in mind, let's take, I mean, I think everybody's seen a studio like Dr. Dre's and you're, you're, you're listening to the music that he's making and it's got, you know, an 808, a Moog synth, maybe some strings, some vocals, and boom, that's it. So there's like six or seven different elements on a lot of his most famous tracks. But he's got this console that is 128 or, you know, 256 channels, some crazy number of channels um, and a very, very expensive console. And you say, well, why, why are there so many channels for something you're not? you're not recording an orchestra or something, but a lot of times what they'll do is they'll bust out the, you know, you've got a drum channel, you've got this dry channel right here. Okay. And then you start creating chains or creating other, uh, channels for the, the fully processed sound. So, so let's imagine that this is a mixing console. Now we've got two channels here. We've got the completely dry 909 kick drum, and then we've got the saturated kick drum. And the reason for that is then you can start carving out the EQ on the process stuff. So you've got things running in parallel. If you if you do the dry wet thing, then you're you're gonna start degrading the the sound. But if you do one fully dry and one fully wet. And then you can carve out the, the wet signal differently than you would carve out the dry signal. So here, now you, you, you don't have anything com, uh, competing. You don't have anything competing with the low frequencies there. So then I can go, okay, right here. You gotta bring that way down. And then you can mix it to taste. So you just got the volume fader um, and, and bring it all the way down. Bring it all the way down and then start creeping it back up. Too much. That's nice there. Where it doesn't, you, you hear the low end still punching through. So that would be, that would be an example. And you've got different, you've got different modes. Play around with these. Uh, saying, uh, describing them doesn't do any good. Just play around with them. See what, see what each of them sounds like. See what each of them are doing.
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you get a lot more flexibility with everything, right? Um, but yeah, if you wanted to bus out, if you wanted to bus out all the drum sounds, so say you've got, say you've got a, well, let's just say this, let's say you, you don't want your kick being affected here. I kind of like the effect on this, but let's say you don't. Then what you would do is you would grab, create an audio track right next to it. Doesn't have to be next to it if you don't want. But then you would pull the audio from Core 909 kit. And then you would do bass drum. Uh, let's do bass drum 909 post mixer. Yeah. So go all the way to, okay, audio effect rack post mixer. So it gives kind of the signal flow of when you're pulling, basically routing that patch cable into another, into another channel of audio. So let's go all the way down so that we got it. So yeah, so I muted I mute it there, but then it's passing through. And now now you can play around with it. And let's say here. Whoops. I need to use duplicate that and then you would have also audio effect rack here and then you've got you've got that going separate and you've got this here Any questions on this? Actually, gonna lower the, the filter on this bass line. Unknown artist, how you doing? See, like sometimes bass lines, like in the case of this one, the bass line, you, you don't necessarily notice it when it's in the mix. And then when you take it out, you're like, oh, okay, there it is. So it's pretty, uh, pretty non-intrusive, but it really carries the groove of the track. bring down this and something you can do which I'm really bad at doing you can rename this so bass let's say bass uh, clean let's do not bass clean see kick 90909 clean um, and then kick not kick with the C And 
by the way, here's something that I've been using lately. Uh, it's called Mackity. If someone in the chat can look up Mackity, it's uh, it's like Mackey, but Mackity, and it's with a plugin called uh, Air Windows. This guy makes incredible and in, in also incredibly very niche stuff. Um, and the stuff is free if you feel compelled and you use it a lot then definitely um i think he's got a patreon account so it's nice to support people that are doing cool stuff but what this guy has done is he made a plugin that perfectly em perfectly emulates the old mackey mixing uh console and if if you ever listen to any techno tracks from the 90s, especially like the Chicago Green Velvet Relief Records tracks, a lot of those were made with these Mackie mixing boards, these old, dirty Mackie consoles. And you could actually, um, you know, when you really drove the, the sound with the gain when it was kind of created this overdriven sound and it, to be honest, it wasn't again context it wasn't the most desirable sound um and it, technically it was not really the best way to go about it but it created this trademark sound that people have been chasing after ever since then because they don't make these old mackie boards anymore and they sound different now well this guy made a um uh, a mackie plugin that emulates the sound perfectly and if you put your kick drums in those there you go there's your little trick of the trade welcome unknown artist See how the, the delays that are kind of moving in and out create a lot of movement? So what I'm gonna also gonna do is we talked a little bit about side chaining. I don't think I side chained anything this last session, did we? Maybe I did on operator. Yep. So I'm gonna copy and paste this side chain here. I'm gonna run it on the returns because a lot of times you can get some proper muddiness coming out of this. And I'm gonna go ahead and put in an EQ8 here, even though it's high passed. I'm gonna put in an EQ8 that's kind of like a a brick wall EQ of some of sorts. Chavarsi! How are you doing? So yeah, this can if, if if things get too constant, they can start uh, just creating layer and layer of of mud and uh, or let's say let's say layer and layer of of dust, and then eventually that dust is gonna all pile up, and then it's gonna become mud at some point. So just just bear in mind that it's always good to to get ahead of it a little bit. Um, so carve out stuff that's not necessary and that you don't need to carve out. You don't need to suck the life out of stuff. You know, you don't need to get so surgical with EQs that um, stuff is fits perfectly in its own little space. And it's like, you know, it's okay 
if your mashed potatoes touch the roast beef on your plate, you know? But some people don't like mashed potatoes right on top of their roast beef. So, you know, use that use that metaphor with, with making music. Um, and then the side chain compression here will create kind of a, a, a little bit of a, it'll dip duck out some of the places where the kick drum, because it's all side chain to the kick drum. And then it'll just create some natural space in between and create follow with the groove you can use the compression as kind of an instrument and you can use it in a discrete way that it's not doing this kind of edm effect uh wah 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 you know but it's a subtle thing where when the music's going you don't really notice it but it is carving out space Threshold down a little bit. See how it's when the threshold's completely released and it's not compressing at all? It's just constant, like 16th note. And then when you start bringing that threshold down. And you can and you can you can bring the threshold to taste, right? It depends on what kind of groove you're looking for. But those are all different ways that you can make things gel a little bit together. What would you guys like to know for for the next sessions, just so I have an idea of where people are at that are tuning in? Where what would you like to know more about? And I can't guarantee that I would know more about it, but I can try my best. So tell me tell me what you're struggling with or what you would like to what you're curious about, what you've always wondered, blah blah blah. And I'll do my best to, to include that. And the more interactive it is, the, the much better these type of things always are. Because I don't want to be teaching something that's not relevant to anybody who's tuning in. So just keep it. Let me know what. Let me know what you want to learn. Something else, and, and a lot of times I'm just saying things as I notice them going along. Um, before I get into automating the volumes or anything, I don't always automate the volumes, and we covered that in an earlier session. But you're, this is already, everything's in, nothing's in the red here. But I've got eight audio channels. And we're already starting in four return channels. And we're already starting, if you pay attention to this here, this is what's coming in. This little bitty tiny meter is what's coming into the master channel. And you can already see it starting to get into the red. So to save yourself heartache down the road once you've started automating stuff, let's just bring down the the volume on everything and you do that if you highlight you can highlight all the tracks so start here and then just highlight it all and you'll notice all the volumes will will move down together okay so yeah and if it's if it's if the 
audio tracks are in a group, it'll just move the volume of the group down. We can push it a little bit. And for those wondering why I've got a limiter on the master channel, I just have a limiter on the master channel so I don't break my ears, my speakers, or worst case scenario, both, and also on the stream so that I don't break your speakers as well, barring. So this, it is nice. I don't, I never want to have the limiter engaged. Um, because what, what can happen, say you start limiting this, and if you start producing into the limiter, the problem is, is when it goes, when you come, when that track eventually goes off to get mastered, you've got to take all that stuff off. And so if you've been producing how it sounds through the limiter, that's if, if you're really limiting the stuff, you're coloring the sound pretty hard. And when you take that off, the track is not going to sound like you thought it did. And then you're going to have to go back and retrace your steps. And it's not going to be that fun. So I use the limiter to as a, as a protective measure. But once I start seeing it ducking the volume, I'll go in and bring down all the audio channels. So it's not, uh, so it's not an issue. So... Oh, Travarsi, yeah. So this is uh, the guy is um, it's Air Windows. Let me just I'll just pull up the link right now. It's amazing. This is these are plugins, and and the the crazy thing is is that his um, his plugins. He's such a uh, a detail oriented person. He doesn't have a graphical user interface with any of his plugins. They just look super basic, like the old school audio units, um, that you used to see many years ago. And his premise behind that is that, uh, GUIs tend to slow down. Uh, they can create some, some latency they can create some aliasing and phasing and and all kinds of stuff he's he's very very detail oriented and yeah so it, uh you're gonna see a really basic plug-in i think it's only an audio unit if i'm not mistaken but man this thing sounds dead up dead up like uh the old mackey boards so Instant, instant techno in those things. And it's free. If you like it, donate to them. Um, Redneck Dis Disco Tech, do you produce a song as an, a separate entity or do you actively think about the fact that you are making a song for a DJ to play? Do you have a different creative process? Do you have different creative processes for DJ intended song? That's a good question. I started producing because uh, I thought that there was um, there were gaps in the techno spectrum, and it wasn't that I thought that I could do something better. It was really. I just wanted to have certain gaps and what I, I felt like my DJ sets were missing something. And so I started making stuff to, to fill those gaps. It, it wasn't, it wasn't anything beyond that. And so I, the nature of my productions have always kind of been DJ oriented. Um, but yeah, there, there are some productions that, I mean, I don't think you need to spell it out for DJs. That's the thing. Don't you? You don't need to insult the DJ's intelligence. Um, I I won't get into that. But uh, what I mean by that is you don't need to make a track boring and lifeless for the first minute and a half, and the last minute and a half so that the DJ has time, plenty of time to cue it up and all this stuff. You don't need to do this. And if, if they need more time, 
every tool nowadays has the loop function and yeah so uh but yeah i mean music music stuff is is pretty formulaic actually music isn't especially in the 4-4 arena which is basically the only music the only stuff that i ever write you know i'm not some crazy jazz musician or something that's doing all kinds of crazy time signatures and and bringing in things and now uh, the in these weird crazy rhythms like techno music's pretty basic and maybe that's why maybe that's why I've gravitated towards it is that it might be the one of the more simple things to to write but um yeah but if you listen to pop music the format's also there, you know, you have eight bars, um, you know, four bars, you can switch things up a little bit, but, but things are very mathematical in how they occur in music. And, and, um, there's, there's very few instances, note very few where, going outside of some of those parameters is actually something that adds value. Um, I, I don't think that that breaking rules for the sake of breaking rules is, is all that it's cracked up to be. Um, I encourage people when they're learning how to create music to, to break every rule that you can, you know, do everything because there's going to be that time if you're a new producer you're going to break every rule because you don't know that any rules exist and then you're going to release a couple records and you're going to want to get better and you're going to want to get up to speed of the people that you really admire and look up to and so you're just going to kind of like textbook the life out of your productions I would say and um then you're going to reach this point where your music becomes so I, this is this is a broad framework um but your 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 next phase is you become so technical that you forget to know when there's rules to break you know you forget when it's good to step out of line and all that and then like the the third phase is when you start being able to appreciate the technical knowledge, but not have it be your guiding light for your creative process. Does that make sense? So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that unless you're insulting a DJ's intelligence, all, all techno music is DJ music, you know? And, um, yeah, there's there's not a lot of necessity to to carve it out and make it more DJ tooly than having it be a four four time signature and a steady kick drum and all that stuff. Um, I would like to know about ghost side chaining. Is that a thing? What do you are you talking about? Like you're basically. Um, you're side chaining what would be a muted track. I don't know this term, but I'm by by the what I'm guessing is that there's something that you would have a muted audio source and you create a rhythm with that and then that audio source is completely not present in in the mix. Is that what you're what you're referring to? I don't know. Any other questions? If not, then I'll keep listening through, and then as, as I come around to other stuff, then uh, then I'll mention it.
I just saved this session and uh, the updates that have been made are in there and then you'll have access to this session. Um, let me make sure it's all self-contained. It should be self-contained already, but just in case it isn't, then there you have it. Yeah. What's my process for reverb on a kick? It's a good question. I uh, I used to use reverb a lot on kicks, and then again, I uh, used all uh, my technical knowledge that I was acquiring to convince myself that a track should never have certain A, B, C, or D on certain parts of it or whatever. And then I've actually started using reverb a little bit more lately on kicks. But uh, what I do is I do kind of a similar thing. So let's do, let's just pull up a basic reverb right here. Let's go all the way wet. Obviously, we ain't having that. Let's group it. And then let's do create a chain. And then we will go first things first. And how much heartache would I have saved myself if I would have known this early on? But we need to put this in mono. Um, because what you're hearing, what you're hearing on reverb and you can do the bass mono. I just say do mono, but some people like the bass mono. So you've got two different presets that are in utility that are kind of ready to go. Mono is just that, but bass mono allows you to engage and say, I want everything below in this case, 120 hertz is the preset, but you can play around with that. You can say, I want everything below 167 hertz to be monoed, and then um, everything above that is still in stereo. And the reason why you need to mono this is because, first off, um, most subs... In a, in a club are wired in mono. Most subs in general are. Like, uh, not to get into the, the physics of it all, but basically, if you wire stuff in, um, in parallel, um, then you can get a lot more, a lot more power out of 
your you can get a lot more mileage out of your amplification because you basically double um, the wattage by lowering the impedance of the speakers. Blah blah blah. Anyways, bass is bass is non-directional, and what I mean by that is when your friend with the big car stereo would pull up, you would never hear the hi hats. You know, you would always hear you would hear them coming from two miles or that would be, uh, let's say, uh, 3.2 kilometers away from your house and it would be shaking the window panes. But then you would only start to hear the hi-hats when he pulled into your driveway. And that's because the, the higher the frequency, the more directional it is. That's why when you're DJing, and someone stands in front of the monitors and has no idea that they're standing in front of the monitors. It's very, very distracting because you can't hear the transients on the kicks and you can't hear the highs. And it's like everything is muffled. But that at that same set of monitors, your neighbor might be complaining about the bass in a separate building from you. Um, and... Yeah. So it doesn't, the, the stereo imaging, you gain, you get no value out of having low frequencies be in stereo. But the, what can happen is those low frequencies can start phasing each other and uh, phasing with each other and then canceling one another out, which is really bad. So you want the speakers all pushing in the same direction with the bass. That was an over explanation, but just put your bass in mono. That's what I'd say. Um, so you can get some, some of the stereo effects on the top end if you want to do the bass mono, but let's just do the mono for the, that now we've got that. Let's roll off. Actually, let's go to EQ eight. Let's roll off. Uh, Eh, let's not do it too sharp. Let's do the 12 dB. I think it's 12 dB this. Um, yeah, 12 dB per octave. So roll it off there. And then I would also roll it off here and kind of create a band pass. And I have done nothing to the reverb. I just pulled it out of Ableton, dropped it in, made it all the way wet, and yeah. And another thing that you can do is then you can go in and there's always these like weird frequencies that you can benefit by notching out. Um... You hear how it's like starting to hum a little bit? Right there. Let's just get rid of that. So there you go. And, and you can play around if you want to have a little bit more life come in. You can always roll that out. But I like, I like the reverb to be kind of beneath the surface and just adding a little bit of body to things. Let's bring that gain down there. bring this boat down here and then you just basically mix the two groups the taste the dry and the wet and then you're off to the races so that's how that's how a very brief overview of how I do Reverbs. One thing about reverbs, and this could be this could be voodoo magic. I don't know, but I swear that using different reverbs on different sounds, like you're gonna have the, you're gonna have your favorite reverb, and 
using different reverbs on different sounds eliminates some of some of the problems with reverb where everything kind of becomes muddied all together in this same no man's land um because reverb is basically pushing things to the back of the mix and the drier sounds stay in the front the problem is 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 reverb you you can do things to keep reverb from equalizing every sound that you have reverb on but i think that you get to that you you eliminate some of those depth issues easier out of the gate if you use different reverb plugins on different sounds and at the very very least don't use so i just dragged and dropped this from ableton out of the presets this was the default template at the very least design the sound of your reverb with different decay times different sizes different pre delays and all of that and that'll keep it from because basically you're you're coloring sound and if if you you you've got your you know a ferrari a garden hose a pair of boots and a television when you spray paint them all red they get a step closer to looking the same and just be mindful of that when you're putting something like reverb on it it's adding you're adding the same character if you've got five of the same reverbs on everything you're adding five of the identical characteristics to five very different sounds so just be mindful of it. But yeah, I'm saving this session. If there's no other questions, I'm going to save this session again so that it'll be up and running. Um, let's. I'm going to do this. I'm going to keep the bass line on. I'm going to turn off this reverb just in case people don't want it. But I'm going to keep it there so that you can see how it's, how not how it's done, how I do it. And yeah, that's it. So uh, Twitch tonight, 9.30 Central European time, 3.30 Eastern time, 12.30 Traversi time. And yeah, join in. It's a lot more laid back, a lot less formal classroom type vibes. But thanks for joining in. And I will see you on the other side or 